Testing one, two. What's that? Yeah. One, two. All right. Is that back on? Testing one, two. One, two, three, four. Oh, no, 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 no. I, yes, but no. <laughs> Had a mouthful of cheese, like. Mm. <clears throat> How's everybody doing? Wonderful. It's good to see everybody here tonight. I know we've got uh, some people watching live streaming, and so we want to welcome everybody to Grace Revolution School of Ministry. And uh, this class is, uh, what is this class? (laughs) It is Aligning Your Heart for Destiny. And uh, it is an opportunity for people to learn how to really set the focus of their hearts so that God will uh, bring personal transformation as well as bring people into the destiny that God has for their lives. And so we want to welcome those who are watching, and we also want to welcome those who are in the room tonight. And then we've got a couple of testimonies. And so, um, Brenda, why don't you go ahead, because we've got a couple of people that are uh, apparently running a little bit late. So, Brenda, why don't you come and share yours for a minute and... And uh, who was the other? Joanne, Joanne. Joanne, there you are. Come on up, Joanne, and get and share your testimony. All right, you you got us in the frame here. <clears throat> All right, I asked. She just shared with me real quickly um, on Sunday uh, about this week, and so why don't you All share right. a little bit with the class? <laughs> Sorry, I'm going to get all teary just to you and talking about. Um, I've just been listening to this Graham Cook doing the meditation, and um, I didn't even know what I was going to say when I got up here, but all I can say is just that, like, I (laughs) posted on Facebook that I've been wrecked, but that's, like, not even a good word because it has such a negative connotation. Um, All I can say is, like, I've just been completely overwhelmed, and undone by the love of God and like seriously every time I put that meditation on I'm just weeping like because his love is so great yeah and um like I feel like in the last week like I've experienced more of his love than I have like through all of my Christian experience (laughs) that's awesome and so um it is just like every time it gets more and more and um like every time I listen to that meditation um it's like the Lord just highlights something different to me and today um one of the things was that we need to get beyond this um belief of having an allowance and get to a place of abundance Mm. um and just abundantly experiencing the love of God yeah so yeah, he's not doling out a little allowance this week, is yeah. he? <laughs> no. It's the whole package. It's the whole enchilada. <laughs> That's awesome. Good. Thank you. Amen. <clears throat> Go ahead, guys. Show your appreciation for Brenda. Woohoo! Let me come a little bit closer this way. I'm not sure how he's doing on the on the video there. <clears throat> okay. And you hold it up right there. A little bit of background with me is I came from a really dysfunctional family. So I had a lot of moving around as a child. and um, Me too. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and changing schools and wondering how I fit in and all that um, in a big way. <laughs> and um, over the years, I went to church a lot to different, different types of churches for about 30-some years. And I was very sick for 12 years. Uh, no, I'm sorry, 25 years, really, really sick, to the point where 
Um, many times I thought I was going to die, and I still had some residual problems from that, especially allergies and things like that. And uh, about two, almost two years ago, I came to his house and really started getting a hold of the grace message. And uh, earlier in the year, I stopped by the church and Pastor Chuck said, how you doing? <laughs> and he really meant it. He, <laughs> so, and I was, uh, I felt, uh, I could be honest and say I really felt stuck. And so he offered to pray with me and seek the word to see if there was something that would be helpful to me to just really see what the word had for me to help. And so he shared the, the uh, tools that we've been learning here this last couple weeks and also in Pastor Trisha's class. And um, they just, uh, the heart meditation well, let's say back it up a little bit. Uh, Pastor Tricia, one time I had gone up for prayer. It's your fault, Tricia. <laughs> and um, uh, I just told her, I, you know, I just don't, I'm just not getting something. And she said, well, it has to get from here to here. So um, I just didn't know how to get it from my head to my heart. And so, I, but I was encouraged that it was going to happen. She said it would happen. And um, as I did the, the tools and focused on the Lord and, and sought him and just really um, became more and more aware of my identity in him, it just really unfolded. And uh, the heart physics meditations that Jim Richards uh, has, uh, there was one near the beginning that really was like a key to me that really opened things up. And it's a point where he says, um, picture Jesus in front of you and picture him stepping into you and then picture you stepping into him. And for some reason that just clicked with me and it just really got from my head to my heart. And so I've, what's happening now with the allergies and things like that? Well, um, stuff. I've done the journaling and like the evening, like journaling at night, uh, Pastor Chuck had told, you had told me to do, about that tonight. you're going to teach about that. And, um, that really helped a lot. And, um, some limiting beliefs and I didn't think they were, I just thought it was natural for me to have allergies all the time, but, um, because I've had them for so long, but when I realized that my identity in Christ had, that I could just put it off, I um, would s sometimes I'll feel like I'm getting an allergic feeling and I will just um, face it and tell it, you know, go away in Jesus' name. I have no, no, um, you have no right to me because Jesus took it all for me. By his stripes I am healed. And uh, so it's putting off and putting on. And so that's been very helpful. And, sure. and also, for 10 years, I've not been able to travel to see my granddaughter, my daughter and my grandchildren in Virginia. And um, I'm planning on going there this Christmas. Yay. So. <clears throat> Good. Thank you. Good. Amen. Thank you, Joanne. Pam, now I, and if you look in your notes, I actually, you can come on up. I spelled her name wrong. It's R A Y E. Yeah, I spelled it wrong. My but my mother had ten children, and she did something weird with every one of our spellings and our names. But how could she have known? I was only number four that she was going to do that. But anyway, um, literally three weeks ago today, I called Pastor Chuck, um, really out of desperation. But I woke up at that morning knowing that I had to speak with him. And um, I'd been to his house services once in Simple Church twice. And so it was my third week of exposure to really truly empowering the body of Christ and teaching us how to really get this in control of this. 
and I mean the first message I heard was the first one on this series um, and so the, I, I just knew my spirit was jumping for joy and I knew I need to be here I have struggled for several the past three years since I turned my face back into his light with being able to maintain over hurts slights pain guilt fear blame and shame from things that I've done in my past and my behavior what I mean I could lay hands on the sick and they would recover I could have a word for somebody I could encourage them I could not understand why I would do what I would do at some certain point of pain a buildup of or whatever I just didn't understand why I would do that and um, so Wednesday three weeks ago I called him to talk to Pastor Tricia and then Pastor Chuck and he told me he said by listening to you you don't know who you are in Christ you don't have your identity he said you have a couple of options and he explained to me what they were and one of them was the Jim Richards teachings I had no idea that's what it was but um, he said, so you decide and come in if you'd like tomorrow. So I called him the next day and I said, he said, well, would you decide? I said, I want to come in. Okay, I'm here. And I meet with him in his office. So what are you going to do? I said, I want to go your route. I don't want to go the other route. And um, so I listened to the introduction for Jim Richards Heart Physics on Thursday and Friday. I, I'm a journal or transcriber and I, I was desperate. I really, really had hit a wall with truly keeping me from really walking where God wants me to. My daughters are disowning me. The most important thing in my life, which had been before in between me and God, was the relationship with my children and grandchildren, and I was destroying it with my behavior. Every once a month, two, every two or three months, whatever, it was, a, it was not a consistent pattern, but there was a point of pain. So I listened to the intro, and I'm like, oh, Lord, oh, my gosh. I mean, I knew within 15 minutes of the intro one that this was it. This was it. Done. Over with. Gone. Over with. That key that really, truly needed turning. And, of course, they're called heart keys, and my heart's just going, you are turned, baby. And so, <laughs> I, and you know, with, a, with those heart physics, you're supposed to do Monday through Friday and take the weekend off. And I did my first heart meditation on Friday night and day five was Tuesday night started day one on Wednesday and when you skip when, when you don't take those two days off and then you're jumping into what you know you're supposed to be writing what your intent is and what your dream and your vision is and all of that I've had my dream and my vision for a long time and I knew that I was in my way my way of making it really come into reality but it, it was a hard pressed I mean I really felt not taking that two-day break and then so I did Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, Saturday, Sunday for the five days of week two and started Monday, week three on a Monday. And then I did take my break this weekend and I did the dream interpretation. And it, those of you that were here, you have a better sense of what you know what that vision is for me. Monday morning, and I have my notes from it because I transcribed. <laughs> okay, <laughs> I'm not going to, to go through all of that with you, but... Um, day one week four with Jim Richards teachings on your meditations I mean I took this diligently that first two weeks I spent three four five hours a day really truly immersed into the teachings of Dan Moeller reading Pastor Chuck's book I only got through chapter four with him I'm on chapter eight now but <laughs> um, and, but the intensive with the heart meditations because that's really what I really des my, I desperately needed to go to that secret place with Jesus and feel his love on the Monday of um, week two day three four whatever that was um, Jesus brought me a lamb and when I shared that with Pastor Chuck and I needed this so much to know that he was my good shepherd and I was his lamb. And I mean, in that week of meditations, that visual of just a lamb in his lap. 
So this past Monday, getting to week four, I mean, I'm like, oh, Lord, I mean, I am so ready. I feel like I'm born again, okay? I mean, like, really, truly, like I didn't feel when I did get saved. And on Monday in that teaching, he asks you to um, look at three screens. And one screen is um, your first screen. You don't, you are choosing an incident a situation, a place in your life that you didn't do well, that you didn't behave the way you would have chosen to do, but you feel completely safe as you literally visualize and play that screen out because you're in your secret place with the Lord. It's real. It is real. The feelings are what you felt. You can remember the words and how all of that, and you're not afraid because you're with Jesus and he's right there by you. He said he's in you and you're in him. And he said he would never leave you and he never does. And I never got that before. And so I'm seeing that. And it was a really hard scene to play because that repetitive pattern was destroying and pushing me away from my children and grandchildren, cutting me off. And so um, the second screen that's straight in front of you, you realize that that was your past and what's in front of you is your present and it asks you to play again another scene where you didn't do well that was more recent, which was a repeat of, you know, the 50 or 100 of them or 200 of them that there have been. And it was like, oh my gosh. Then you, he asks you to ask yourself, is this what you want? And how would your, how, if you had trusted God then, and then the next, and how that would have been different if you had trusted that he was truly there with you. And so then, and this is the part that I am going to read, then when I got to um, the third screen, which is your future, it was blank. Because Jesus tells you, because we have free will and we have choice, and the, cho the choice is ours. What do we want for that future? And so now what you have is then without words, Jesus communicates to you. I can't show you the future until you choose the future you want. Now for the first time, I realize that I will have the future that I do want, that I'm choosing because I want that future filled with love, joy, peace, and productivity. And I knew that it was a time to truly trust God. So I decided in my heart to allow Jesus to take me to a life without limits. And as I'm seeing this, my vision, what the Lord's given me to purpose in my life, I broke out in uncontrollable, joyful, sobbing, laughter. I mean, in this place with Jesus, I'm, I still have 10 minutes to go in the meditations. I'm laughing so hard my face is hurting. <laughs> I am so full of his joy because I see what he's doing. I see what is happening. I see it unfolding. I'm trusting in ways that I have never been able to overcome and trust before. I've been able to do it on my own power, but never in his power. Good. So it's amazing grace. Amen. Good. That's good. So tonight we're going to uh, dig right into some more stuff about the heart. And by the way, for those who are watching or those in the room, if you're interested, you can uh, go to impactministries.com. Calm. And uh, Jim Richards has got those meditations called Heart Physics, so those are available uh, through their ministry, and you're welcome to, to do that. Some great tools. <clears throat> so we're gonna t I'm going to start now. I want to give you some principles for heart transformation, and these are ones that I do in pretty much every class. I go over these, and I just want to go over them again because we need to hear them over and over again until they become something beyond our head and get into our hearts, Okay. So, principles for heart transformation. When, when you're cooperating with Jesus to have him change your heart, remember, we're not trying to persuade our own hearts. 
He's the author and finisher of our faith. We're just coming into agreement. We're, we're, we're turning our hearts in the right direction so that he can author and finish faith inside of us. We're, we're participants. We're, we're doing this with him, but he's the one who's, who's taken up the task to persuade our hearts. And so, um, so, but as we're gaining the language and the tools and we're saying the same thing, confession, you know, we used to hear, you know, about positive confession and confession really is kind of meaningless if it's just coming out of this. It, it, this is something about a heart confession. The word confession means to say the same thing as. And so to say the same thing as what God is saying or what he's done or what he's seeing. So there's several things that the principles for heart transformation. And that is, number one, that it's always going to be present tense. We've, we've talked about this a lot already, but, but I, I just need to remind you. This is, you're never going to do this thing about getting your heart shifted and changed and believing something new from a place of the future. I'm going to trust you in the future, or I used to do something in the past. Everything that you begin to deal with in an identity way is always going to be present tense. It's not, I'm going to be um, saved. I'm going to be uh, holy. I'm going to be righteous. All that is a disconnection from what Jesus has already done for you. So it's always going to be, I am. That's why Paul would say in Galatians 2.20, I am crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live. Yet not I, but Christ lives in me. In the life I live in the flesh, I live by the faith of the Son of God. It's an I am present tense reality. So as you're, as you're learning to do exercises, write things on your heart, you just need to know right up front, it's always when it's talking about you and your identity, you always got to begin to learn how to come into this as a present tense experience. Number two, it's always personal. It's always personal. This is, it's never going to be about you trying, involving somebody else in the process. Like, I am going to be happy when my children start acting right. <laughs> My husband won't, you know, quits watching football games on Sunday after church, whatever it may be. The moment that you involve another person in that, you have made it an impossibility for it to ever change. Because now you have to exercise some kind of form of control to try to get that person to be different in order for you to be happy. Or for you to be different. So this is person. It is I am me. It's not somebody else. It's not dependent on anybody. This is about me personally. I am crucified. I live in Christ. It's positive. Generally speaking, you want to turn these things into the. I remember this whole thing. Largely is about identity, and you have to turn these things. In, it's not. I am going to quit smoking. What's wrong with that? It's future tense and. It's negative. It's like, I'm going to quit. I'm going to, I've got to, now I've got to figure out how to do that. Instead of seeing yourself the way God does and maybe seeing yourself healthy. I am healthy in Christ. I have his health, his DNA in my bones. That, that kind of, you state it positive. We all naturally resist the negative. You know, we, we tend to, you, you, you tell somebody, Quit smoking. They're, you know, they're, that's a negative thing, and they're already going to withdraw. But if you begin, you're going to help them to be healthy. That's a different dynamic altogether. It's repetitive. This is a journey in which you're going to repeat these things in your heart, your confessions about who you are in Christ, and so forth. They're going to be things that you're going to repeat over and over and over again. When uh, children learn at the speed of light when they're little bitty kids. I mean, they're crawling around. They don't have language yet, but they're able to see. And what they're seeing, they're learning from their environment by what they see. And they're interpreting and experiencing life based on simply what they're seeing with their eyes and some with their ears as well, but primarily with their vision. And, and it's with those little children, they see things over and over again. Then they begin to form beliefs and ideas and opinion they learn at an accelerated pace and for all of our lives that's the same way just because you're all grown up now 
doesn't mean that there's not a need for some place of a discipline of bringing your heart into the right place. Remember, we're not creating this stuff in our heart. We're just aiming our heart towards heaven. But there's a discipline to keep doing that and keep repeating that. Wake up every day and keep doing it over and over again. Um, principles for heart transformation. Um, it's it's going to primarily be in pictures. Remember we talked about last week, the heart, the head is a place of concepts, but the heart is the place of meaning. And if we're trying to get from our head to our heart, one of the ways that we do that is that we have to personalize that through pictures. In other words, we have to see ourselves as if that reality is already done, as if it's already true. And we said last week as well, this is a little bit of review, that the more you do that, you're actually rewiring the circuits of your brain from what it was previously to a new pathway that experiences are going to go through your brain and be processed differently the more you see yourself differently than you do now. Uh, it's also spoken internally and externally. All these things that we're going to talk about, it's internal and external. It's a belief internally. It's a confession externally. We believe in our hearts if you confess with your mouth Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you'll be saved. Every bit of sozo, deliverance, healing, ministry, uh, freedom, wholeness, all that is encapsulated in that word sozo or salvation. It's something we believe in our heart and we say with our mouth. And the reason that we say it with our mouth, I mean, most, maybe other people are different, but for me, it's really hard for me to say something about myself I really don't believe. I think that's probably true for most people because you try to get them to say, I am righteous in Christ, and they're like, they, 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 there's something that they have. Why? Because they don't believe it yet. So we believe it, and then it comes out of our mouth as a confession. What you're doing is you're taking that which is spiritual and invisible, and when you confess it, you're bringing it into the natural. It's becoming real. It's being spoken. It, it's, it's coming into this world as opposed to just the spiritual world. And you're already embodying something the moment that you begin to speak that. Now, is that a stretch or a hand raise? Okay, just checking. <clears throat> it's one of the reasons that baptism is so powerful is because when you're baptized, you're all the, you are seeing yourself in that old life. The old identity is being buried with Christ. You're being raised up in newness. You're identifying. This is an I am moment when you're being baptized. You're identifying with the, your new nature and your new reality, your new identity in Christ when you come up out of that water. Just as Jesus was buried and just as he was raised, so you've been buried and you've been raised to newness of life too. It's powerful because it's using all of those dynamics all at the same time. The very first part of your Christian life, it's starting you off with your heart, your confession, with the experience, with seeing Jesus, your identity, that whole thing, your Christian life starts at day one, if you're baptized on that first day, as, um, as a heart change when it comes to this reality. Does that make sense? All right, so, so let's talk about tonight. That was, that was just a little review stuff. Let's talk about uh, communion from union. Communion from union. This is a little bit of a of a, a follow-up from the very end of what we did last week, but I want to expand on it, and then I'm going to, when I get done, I'm going to invite Trish up, and she's going to come teach for a little while, and then I'm going to come back and finish with a tool that will help you guys in the future. So, so communion from union. Now, tonight we're going to do a lot more practical exercise stuff. We're going to, you're going to do some stuff. So uh, those that are watching, I want to encourage you to do that right now. Get out a piece of paper and make sure you're a uh, participant in this because, because we don't, this school is never meant, meant to be a place where we're just giving you information and you go, now you know something you didn't before. Uh, we, we want to break up the foundations that are, that are not of God and we want to lay Christ as the foundation and then give you the tools to put into practice the things that we're talking about. So, so what we're going to talk about, first of all, is identify your I am not. 
So you're going to need a piece of paper because this is what I want you to work on this week, tonight, and throughout the rest of this class. There's probably a bunch of I am nots that we could um, be dealing with, but we want to figure out what is your I am not. As we said last week, everything comes back to two major things. You're either, you're either struggle. it's either you're in a good place because you understand I am blank or you're in a bad place because it's I am blank. And so what I want you to do is, is what is the I am not that you're struggling with primarily, primarily in your life? What's the one thing that we could work on this week? <clears throat> Remember, we, we talked about last week, somebody asked you about being overweight and uh, they identified a physical problem, <clears throat> you know, may, maybe potentially. And, but the I am overweight is not what I'm after because behind the I am overweight is another belief that says I'm powerless to change. I'm, um, I'm not worthy. I'm unlovable. There's all kinds of negative beliefs that's behind that kind of stuff. So don't, uh, we want to get to the very root of some of this. So what do you think is the I am not that is the true thing that is driving a lot of your life? Is it the something's wrong with me? I'm not good enough. I'm not lovable. I'm powerless or I have no power if we're going to say it in a negative way. I'm not acceptable. I am rejected. It'd be the opposite of that. I'm not good enough. I'm not qualified for God to do this. I mean, think about the times that you go to prayer and you're like, I'm not sure if he's going to do this. Really what we're saying is, I'm not sure I'm qualified for him to answer this prayer. What is, what is one of those, and maybe there's another one that the Holy Spirit will put his finger on. If there's one that you feel like is driving a lot of stuff in your life, I want you to just go ahead and write it down. Or you're not, your neighbor doesn't have to see it. Um, <clears throat> no looking on each other's paper. <laughs> no cheating. Um, you can't steal somebody else's identity. No identity theft. <laughs> so has everybody picked one that you could, you could practice on tonight? Okay. So self-control would be a fruit of the Spirit, but, it, but if it feels like I'm out of control, you could use, I, I'm, I don't feel like I'm in control, um, that I have no self-control. No self <laughs> um, actually, nobody has control. <laughs> That's the illusion <laughs> is we think we have some control. Um, Somebody else, you, you're, anybody else have something that you want to, you're working through trying to figure it out. Everybody got one that you want to tackle this week? Okay. Front row. Good. All right. Good. So, so let's, let's deal with that. This is the one you're going to work on. Now, Brittany is an amazing actor. I don't know if you know that she doesn't just sing. She also dances and she acts. And she's like the full package. She's got the makeup thing going on. She does professional makeup. She's, she's got it going on. So um, she could probably teach us a little bit more about this whole idea that I'm going to share with you. It's about, uh, about method acting. You guys have heard of that before. There are all different kinds of, did some research on it today. There's all different kinds of streams of that. Um, but in method acting, basically what you're doing an actor is doing is the difference between somebody who's just sort of reading their lines and pretending to be this character versus in method acting what they do is they they try to in a sense become that character they want to try to think like the character they want to um, know the motives and feel the emotions and they some of them not all of them apparently but some of them will stay in character on the set the whole time they'll dress up they want to be addressed as 
you know, the pirate or whatever the whole time. They, they, they get into the role so dramatically that they try to become that person and not just simply do the acting to try to act like that person. Is that a pretty good summary of, of method acting? Part of it is, the, is uh, one of the things they do is uh, the key phrases in method acting is the phrase as if. So as if you were this character. Now, what I want to encourage you guys to learn how to do is do some method acting with Jesus. I want you to imagine yourself as Jesus. Not just, it, not just you know, I'm trying to act like Jesus. I'm trying to act like Christ. I want you to try to put yourself in the role of being Jesus. What would it feel like? What would it, what would he be thinking? What would he be, how would he be perceiving things? Because this is actually very, very biblical. uh, James says in uh, 1, James chapter 1, verse 23 and 24, he says, for if anyone is a hearer of the word and not a doer, highlight on the doer, He's like a man observing himself, his natural face in a mirror, for he observes himself, goes away, and immediately forgets what kind of man that he was. So God wants you to look in the mirror and see Jesus and not walk away and forget what manner of man you are. But that word doer is the word, a Greek word that means a poetic performer. Yes. A poetic performer. That's somebody who doesn't just read the lines. It's not somebody who just sort of play acts something else. It's somebody like a poetic performer is one who gets into the role. They imagine who that character is. It's method acting. They, they, They perceive that person and they act and they stay in character. And God wants you and I to begin to learn how to stay in character in your identity in Christ. So how are you and I going to be able to do that if we don't know what He thinks, how He feels, and how He perceives the Father? See, you're in union with Jesus. He actually wants you to feel what He feels about the Father. He wants you to see what He sees about the Father. He wants you to imagine what He is thinking, feeling, perceiving about the Father. And because this whole thing about the gospel is you have been joined to Him. He wants to reveal the Father to you. Not reveal the Father to you separate from Him like Jesus is up there, you're down here, and He's going to like tell you about God. No, He wants you to see yourself in Christ, imagining how the Father is treating Jesus is exactly how He's treating you. How the Father is thinking about Jesus is exactly how He's thinking about you. But we disqualify ourselves and we're trying to figure out what does God think about this lowly, sinful, messed up ball of wax down here on earth and Jesus is amazing. And that is not the gospel. The gospel is that you died and your life is hidden with Christ in God. So now for the rest of your life, Jesus wants to reveal the Father by helping you to see how He feels and thinks and experiences the Father because that's exactly how He does for you. Does that make sense? Y'all are are, are y'all um, in deep meditation about this or, or am I freaking you out or what's you, you got to step into Jesus shoes if you need help listen to the by the way those who are watching there's a CD here by Graham Cook and it's called Becoming the Beloved and uh, you can probably look that up on the internet uh, somewhere and buy that CD but it's a great uh, tool So you've got to be willing to imagine yourself as Jesus for a few moments. And that is how he reveals the Father to you. (laughs) 
See, already there's probably, uh, tell, me, tell me the kinds of things you're, you're feeling right now. You're like, what's the weirdness about that? Because those are actually, the, those places of weirdness, those are actually the very places that God wants to reveal the Father to you. Jesus wants to reveal the Father to you. Because you don't seem like you feel like in that area of your life, like you belong, that you are equal with the Son, co-heir with Christ, joint heirs with Jesus. That the Father, that when God raised Jesus from the dead and, and went to heaven and sat on the throne, that he wasn't just carrying himself up there, he carried you with him. You are seated together with him in Christ now forever. And God is not defining you according to who you were. You're dead. And your life is hidden with Christ in God. This is who you are now. So God sees you through Jesus. So, but until you see yourself in that place, you will constantly feel like you're disqualified and whatever's on your list is exactly what is, is a result of that very thing. It is a sense that somehow you have to get yourself there and you don't. He did it for you. You're not the hero of the story. Jesus is. He did it all. All to him I owe. So, so let's look at um, union. You'll see in your notes there, union with our sufferings and weaknesses. So I want you to method act here in just a minute. As you do, we're going to do a little meditation time. Basically, I'm going to plug in some music, and I'm just going to give you a chance to start thinking about and imagining and picturing some of this uh, in your heart before the Lord. Uh, there's some great tools, like we talked about Jim Richards and the uh, heart physics things, are great tools. But, but there comes a place where you're going to have to learn to do this without somebody else's tools. You, you've got to begin to learn how to... I mean, they didn't, they didn't have this for 2,000 years. We're just developing the technology to be able to do some of these meditations on CD. And there's nothing wrong with them. I'm, <clears throat> I've got some. So, but the, the key is learning how to do this for yourself. <clears throat> so um, Hebrews chapter 4, verse 15. For we do not have a high priest who cannot sympathize with our weaknesses, but was in all points tempted as we are, yet without sin. He sympathizes with your weakness. He, he was tempted in every way. The temptation was real in every way. When Jesus incarnate, the Son of God, comes into the earth, we need, to, we need to get this picture in our mind. He came into our darkness. He came into His world, our darkness. He took on human flesh. We'll talk about this more over Christmas time. We'll talk about the incarnation. But He took on human flesh. He took on human weakness. Jesus, though He never sinned, He felt the pressure of our darkness. You see what you've got written on your paper there, the I am not that you've got written there? Jesus felt the pressure of that darkness trying to press into His existence. And from the inside, He had to see His Father. He had to, he had to stay in a place of seeing the Father. And what did the Father say to Him about that particular weakness? So much so that, that he continually was overcoming all of the pressure of darkness, all of the temptations, all of the weaknesses that every human being went through, goes through. He felt them, though he didn't surrender to them. And the reason he didn't surrender and he was without sin is because he saw something about the Father that you're not seeing. He's seeing something about the Father. In other words, he saw that he was, that the Father was pleased with him, for instance. And in seeing that, he was able to overcome some things. He saw things that the Father was showing him because this whole thing is not about a generic God and Jesus down here. Everything is about Father-Son relationship and the power of the Holy Spirit. 
It's about this relationship from the, between the two, the Father and the Son, through the power of the Spirit that every one of us have been caught up in in order to experience and know God. <clears throat> so we've got to ask ourselves, if He was touched with the feelings of our infirmities, and He constantly turned to His Father and saw the truth of who He was, what did He see? Wonder what he saw. Wonder what the Father was showing him. Wonder what Jesus, the Son of God, forget your stuff for a minute. What was Jesus, the Son of God, human flesh, what was the Father saying to Jesus about that very pressure that you've got written down there? Because he felt it. It was real. What did he feel as Jesus? What did it feel like for confidence to surge through the Son of God, the Jesus, the Christ? What did it feel like truth would hit the life of, of Jesus, hit his heart, and he was able to overcome that very thing? What does faith feel like for Jesus? We're talking method acting. We're talking about you picturing him, you, you trying to get into his character. Wonder what the Son of God felt like when he saw the truth that his father spoke over his life. It wasn't just the one time when he was, when he was baptized and the father said, This is my beloved son in whom I'm well pleased. His whole life, when he was 12 years old, the Bible says that, that you know, his parents left the, um, and he's still in the, in the, the temple and he's reasoning and talking and, and astounding the leaders that are there. And he says, I must be about my father's business. I mean, he's already 12 years old and he's, he knows his father. And his father in heaven is teaching him. And he, what did that feel like? What was it like? What did he say? What if Jesus, that means Jesus had to face what sickness, disease, all kinds of, of, of physical stuff that came against Jesus. He's touched by the feelings of our infirmities, every single one of them. That's in his life, not just his... The, the, the sufferings of Christ didn't start on the cross. His, it was the moment he was incarnated that he begins to live his life. And this battle is and this war is raging, but him to keep his identity in the face and the pressure of the very thing you've got written there. And yet he saw something about the Father. And sickness tried to come on him. He saw something about the Father, and he was able to push that stuff off. He was able to resist that. He was able to see something and believe something about the Father. wonder what it was. What was it he was thinking? What was it he was feeling? See, when you begin to think like that, <clears throat> then you can put yourself in Christ in those moments. You read those stories where Jesus is baptized and it's not just about his baptism because he's representing humanity. He's the Lamb of God that takes the sins of the whole world away. And when he's, the Father says over Jesus, this is my beloved Son in whom I'm well pleased. When you're in Christ, he is now, when you can see what Jesus felt like, experience that. Now you put yourself in Christ and you see that, that he wasn't just saying that about the Son of God. He's saying that about all the sons and daughters that he brought to glory. Because you're in Christ. Are you guys following me? <clears throat> Ephesians 4, 11. And he himself gave some to be apostles, some prophets, some evangelists, some pastors and teachers. For the equipping of the saints for the work of ministry. For the edifying of the body of Christ. Till we all come to the unity of the faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God. Now let me take the and out. That means both of these are true on both sides of this and. Let me take the other side of that and out so that you can really follow this sentence. Till we all come to the unity of the faith of the Son of God. You understand that maturity in our lives looks like that we see the Father just the way the Son does. That we start perceiving the love of the Father with the same vision that Jesus does. It's the faith of the Son of God. We're growing up into seeing the Father the way that the Son of God sees the Father. 
the way the son sees the love of the father and the faithfulness of the father and the goodness of the father. When we start to see how he treats Jesus, it is a testimony of how he sees you. And you can have the same faith because you're experiencing the same perspective of who God is. It's not that God takes you up into heaven and he just sort of tells you, you know, that God over there, he's, he's really holy and he's really like powerful and he's, he's just really scary. You know, he's like, this, um, he's like this invisible power being over in the corner somewhere. No, God is always revealed. I'm coming to your question. God is always revealed in Christ in terms of the relationship that the son has with the father and the father has with the son. This dynamic is the explanation of how we were all destined to be. He is the forerunner. He is the example. He is the one that we look to to know God. How do you know God? Well, the way that you know God is how did the Son and the Father relate to one another? That's how you know how God is. As we said last Sunday, you can't... Jesus said things like, no one has seen the Father at any time except the son. Moses never saw the father. David never saw. None of them ever even had a glimpse compared to what Jesus did. So you can learn things and we can all learn things from them, but, but not, we cannot have be introduced to the father except by seeing this relationship of the son and the father together. If y'all hear this again in a sermon in the next few weeks, y'all just shout and say, amen. I've never heard that before. Pam. <laughs> right. Yes. And, and it's contingent on us seeing what he saw. It, it is, remember, you've been given the mind of Christ. You have in your spirit, because your spirit's joined to his spirit, you're given the mind of Christ. God, in, in the, the spiritual realm, God wants to impart to you, the Son wants to reveal the Father to you. He desires to reveal the Father to you. But... He's not, we have grown up hearing that it's like he's doing it separate, like God's talking to you down here. And while we're down here, we're feeling disqualified because we're not good enough and we're not, um, we're not loved, we're not acceptable. And we're trying to figure out how that God could ever talk to us. And we never feel like we're really hearing him and we have a relationship with him. And it's because we missed this whole important thing that, that you're in Christ, you died. What qualifies is the fact that you're in Him. And the way the Father treated the Son is exactly the way that He's treating and relating to you. So when God reveals the Father, then we start to see Him the same way that Jesus does. And this says, we got job security here. <laughs> Apostles, prophets, pastors, teachers, evangelists, uh, you know, uh, the, whole, the whole group here. We're going to be around for a while until we all come to the unity of the faith of the Son of God. To a perfect man. To the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ. Wow. Y'all better get busy because I'm ready to go to heaven. <laughs> Me and you both. That means that it, maturity in the body of Christ for us means that we get to embody the faith of Jesus. Not just Jesus lived a life of faith, but Jesus' faith is not just some, he remembered all the scriptures so that he could, you know, he, 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 was, he could quote the scriptures to himself so he could keep himself going. I'm not, he memorized the scriptures for sure. But when he was tempted by the devil in the wilderness, he wasn't quoting scriptures at the devil. He was saying, I embody these truths and I stand in these truths. That's why you don't have a place in me. 
wasn't memorizing it and quoting it to the devil. And it's, oh my gosh, the devil's freaked out because he heard the word. The, the devil knows the word better than most Christians. And what he's afraid of of Christians that embody it. And Jesus was in all this stuff that we're talking about, all these I am nots, he was tempted, pressured, and yet he saw something and he, he embodied faith. What is faith? It was just seeing God for who he really is. He trusted his father. And as he trusted his father, that picture is what Jesus wants to give to you. He wants you to see the father the way that he does in that same area of pressure in your life. Does that make sense? So, so uh, Philemon verse one, chapter one, verse six. Don't go to Philemon chapter two. <laughs> one six, King James version says that the communication of thy faith may become effectual by the acknowledging of every good thing that is in you in Christ Jesus. Now think about that. That, that word communication is the same word for communion. It's not talking about talking. It's saying the word, remember the word we, t- we said the other day, one of the nice, the word communion means to share. That the sharing, the, that you share, the sharing of your faith, where his faith becomes your faith, And your faith is his faith. This sharing dynamic that comes with communion with God. That it may become effectual by the acknowledging of every good thing that is in you in Christ Jesus. Everything that's in you because you're in Christ and Christ is in you. When you acknowledge that, when you see that, when you perceive that, when you see how the Father loves and deposited all this goodness in Jesus, you got to know that He's deposited all that goodness in you. When you acknowledge the good things, when you start saying the I am instead of the I am not in your heart, it awakens faith. It joins your faith to His faith. And the two become one. Does that make sense? B here, union in our worship. Union in our worship. I I was in a meeting, a couple of meetings, I guess. I was in a meeting recently. I'm trying to think of where it was. I think it was in Murfreesboro. It was a guy from uh, Ireland that was here and went to the service really good and there's Phil Drysdale and uh, while I'm there I'm just pondering during the day this whole thing about me being discovering how the son felt about the father and the father felt about the son and and the worship you know I'm still just kind of thinking through this and worship started and I was in a different mindset And I was just imagining, instead of me down here worshiping God up there in heaven, I imagined myself in the throne room as Jesus worshiping the Father. Here's what the scripture says. For both he who sanctifies and those who are being sanctified are all of one. You're one with him. He's made himself one with you. For which reason he's not ashamed to call them brethren, saying... So here's Jesus. He's he's about to say some things. Here's what Jesus is saying. I will declare to the Father. This is him speaking to the Father. Because this is the relationship that we're coming into, that we're getting to experience. He says, I will declare your name to my brethren. So Jesus is declaring the Father to us. He's saying to the Father, Father, I'm going to declare your name, all that you are, Jehovah Shalom, Jehovah Jireh, all these things that you are. I'm going to declare those, Father, to my brothers because they're they're here, they're with me, they're in me. Look what else it says. He's saying to the Father, in the midst of the assembly, I will sing praise to you. Wow, do you know that when we worship on Sunday... Jesus is in the room 
And he's actually wanting us to embody his worship 